Welcome back. For this lesson, we're going to go over events in more detail because we need to understand events before writing Lambda functions. Why do we need to understand events? Because Lambda is event-driven. Event-driven means that our code gets executed when triggered by an event. This goes back to what we discussed in the first lesson about serverless architecture. This kind of event-driven code execution is really nice because it completely automates execution for us. We set it up once, and then it runs according to the way we set it up. It's also really nice because it allows us to fine-tune permissions. Since we need an event to trigger code execution, we can limit which events trigger which functions. Anything out of those bounds will fail. Now, for our event-driven code execution, we do need three things. First, we need a function to execute. Second, we need an event source. And third, we need correct permissions. Since we already covered handlers and context in the first lesson, I'm not going to cover it again in this lesson, so let's take a look at event sources. What are event sources? Event sources publish events that invoke the Lambda function. Once invoked, Lambda executes code by passing in the event itself to the handler, which we covered in the first lesson. How does Lambda keep track of all these event sources? By using event source mapping and we'll get to that in more detail in a moment. So what do I mean by event sources? What are they? Well, we have access to a few different ones. There are AWS services like Amazon S3, DynamoDB, and SNS. There are also Amazon services like Amazon Echo, which provides really interesting use cases. And we can also have scheduled events. Now, in addition to using event sources, we can actually directly invoke functions using AWS SDKs and HTTP calls through the Amazon API Gateway, for example. This can be very useful for certain situations like mobile applications. Here's a complete list of supported AWS services. We have CloudWatch Logs, CloudFormation, Cognito, DynamoDB, Kinesis, S3, Simple Email Service, and Simple Notification Service. However, we can also use other AWS services as long as they publish data to one of the above event sources. For example, CloudTrail, which records API access events, is not supported in this list, but when it stores records in S3, S3 is a supported service, so that will still work. Another available source of events is called Scheduled Events. As the name implies, we can schedule AWS Lambda to execute a Lambda function on a regular basis. You can set a fixed schedule, like execute every three hours, or you can also specify a cron expression. Now keep in mind that this is currently only available through your console, but I wouldn't be surprised to see that change in the future. All right, let's first take a look at setting a rate. A rate specifies an interval at which we want to invoke, invoke a Lambda function. This can be minutes, hours, or even days, with a minimum of five minutes. To set a rate, we need to have a value and a unit. The value must be a positive integer, and the unit can be minutes, hours, or days. To give examples, you could set a rate of one day, three days, or 10 minutes. Note the emphasis on day versus days. Amazon decided to be grammatically correct, so keep that in mind here. Something else to keep in mind is that the first execution of this rate happens immediately, and then continues at whatever interval we set. Now the cron expressions offer a little bit more flexibility. Cron expressions have a minimum of five minutes and all fields are required to fill out. These fields are uh, minutes, hours, the day of the month, the month itself, the day of the week, and year. And also keep in mind that the time zone is in coordinated universal time only right now. Now let's take a look at filling out these cron expressions and what values can be used. As you can see, there are quite a few options and that's what gives cron expressions their flexibility. I'll, I will let you scan through these at your own pace, so you can pause this video if you'd like, or you can visit the AWS documentation that has this chart at the link I added on the slide. But before I move on, let me give you a few examples. With cron expressions, we could invoke a Lambda function at the same time every single day of the week, like nine, at 9 a.m. for example. We could also invoke a function every day except on weekends, so Monday through Friday at 9 a.m. as another example. One more example would be a cron expression that invokes a Lambda function every first day of the month. 
Now, something important to keep in mind is that you can't set a day of the month and day of the week at the same time because a day of the month doesn't always fall on the same day of the week. So we would set one of these values as a question mark. The question mark just means no specific value as you can see in this chart. So this chart right here is a really good reference if you forget, which is very easy since there are so many options. Now, why would you want this kind of flexibility? Well, you could do a lot with this. For example, you could rotate a gallery of images or a list of articles every single day. On top of that, you could even notify users that the gallery or list has changed by sending an Amazon SNS notification to your mobile application. This would happen reliably and on a set schedule. If, for whatever reason, the job fails, you can configure SNS notifications to alert you that something went wrong. And this goes back to automation. You set it up once and you're good to go. So we've now covered the major available event sources, but we haven't talked about event models. While event sources publish events, event models dictate how AWS Lambda detects an event, which then causes it to trigger a function. In other words, is Lambda checking for these events, or are event sources telling Lambda about new events? Well, it depends on the event source, and that's where the push-pull event model comes in. The push event model directly invokes the Lambda function, so the push model tells Lambda about a new event. This means that we need to store the source mapping in the event source. The event sources that use a push model are S3, SNS, Cognito, Amazon Echo, and user applications. But wait a minute, I haven't even explained event source mappings yet. Event source mapping is what keeps track of which event maps to which function, because otherwise, how would Amazon keep track? Now the reason we need to know this is because it changes which API we call to set up events. With the push model, or S3 more specifically, as an example, if we want to set up an event that listens for a post to a specific bucket, then we need to call S3's API and set up the event through S3. On the other hand, a pull model is the opposite. With the pull model, we call AWS Lambda's API to set up event source mapping. Because in this case, Lambda pulls a service to know whether a new event has occurred or not, instead of the service telling Lambda. The pull model is used by DynamoDB Streams and Kinesis. This slide gives you more information into how Amazon maps and orders events from sources to function, but it is important to understand because it slightly changes how you configure your functions and permissions. So let's illustrate the difference between push and pull models with use case examples. The first example using SNS, imagine that we have a message published to an SNS topic. We've configured SNS source mapping to notify AWS Lambda about this event. So SNS pushes that event to Lambda which then invokes the corresponding function. Lambda receives the message, manipulates it, and then sends it back out. So with this example, we could send an offer to your user who just completed your game. They completed all the different levels, so you send them a customized message to try and get them to buy another level, or maybe even another game. Or you could ask them to share on social media and give them a reward. The possibilities are huge here. Another example, this time with S3, a user uploads a file to a bucket that you would like to compress. S3 has event source mapping configured to notify AWS Lambda and our function gets called. The function compresses and puts the compressed file in another bucket. On the other hand, with the pull model, we can have DynamoDB Stream set to keep track of item updates. But this time, DynamoDB Streams don't notify AWS Lambda. Lambda pulls the DynamoDB Streams. If it detects a change, then it invokes the function that corresponds to it. This is why the event source mapping is configured with the AWS Lambda API. And uh, the same goes with the Kinesis example. So that's the difference between push and pull, and that's why we should understand it. Keep in mind that this, is, this may make more sense once we get to the hands-on practice. When we manually set up the event source mapping, if you don't completely understand just yet, you'll get it then. But before completing this lesson and moving on, I want to cover two more important things. We've mentioned permissions a few times throughout this lesson, so let's see what we need to understand about permissions when it comes to Lambda. Lambda functions are private by default for security reasons. 
This means that only the AWS account that created the Lambda function can invoke that function or even get configura configuration information from it. So we need to grant permissions if we want to use our function with any other service or resource. In order to execute a Lambda function, AWS Lambda needs to have the right execution role, which you may already know as an IAM role. If your function needs to access other services while it is executing, then we also need to grant the execution role for the specific actions we're trying to accomplish. For example, if we're trying to add an item to DynamoDB, we need permission to insert information in the table. So that's what I mean by specific action. The way that we do this is slightly different depending on the model. For the push model, the event source needs permission to invoke our Lambda function. However, with the pull model, AWS Lambda needs the permission to pull a service, like the DynamoDB stream, for example, and you could grant permission in the same IAM role that you created for AWS Lambda to use when executing your function. Again, this will make a lot more sense when we do it hands-on, but understanding the basics will prepare you for that. One final point I'd like for you to know is that there are two different invocation types, an event invocation and a request response event. The event invocation type is asynchronous, which means that it is not expected to return a response. Uh, this is actually the default type used for services. Now, request response is synchronous, which means that it is expected to return a result. And this is the default type used by the AWS console and HTTPS calls. When using the invoke API, you could also specify the dry run parameter. This parameter will block the function from actually executing, which is really useful for testing permissions and inputs to see if they succeed or not. We now have a solid grasp of how events work with Lambda, so we're ready to go to the next lesson. Go ahead and complete this lesson, and I'll see you in the next one.